So, um, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto. We'll start with a karakia, and the one, the one that I'd like to use for tonight uh, has to do with um, acknowledging that we're gathering uh, and that, that our purpose is to seek knowledge for understanding and we should have purpose in all that we do. Stand tall, be strong, and let's show respect for each other. Etifano hui, faya te mata ranga ki marama. Kia fai take nga mahi katoa. Tu maya, tu kaha. Aroha atu, aroha mai. Tato ia tato katoa. I'm, jo I'm Joanna Santa Barbara, and I'm co chair of the Nelson Tasman Climate Forum, which is a community group for urgent action on climate change. And we're collaborating in, in this series of Meet the Candidate events with Tasman Environmental Trust um, and uh, Gillian Bishop, my co-host, uh, represents Tasman Environmental Trust, which works to protect and restore our natural heritage. We're running these Meet the Candidates events because we see it as vital for our local councillors to take effective climate action. This is a crucial three years as we approach the 2030 milestone by which we've agreed to almost halve our emissions and in which we must start adaptation processes and respond to the biodiversity crisis. We're eager to see how you'll handle this unprecedented challenge to those who wish to be governance leaders in this region. And we thank you for standing for public office. I'll share a few words about the procedure that we'll use tonight. Our session will run until 8.30 p.m. and roughly two thirds will be spent on questions elicited from members of the Climate Forum uh, and from Forest and Bird and from Nelson Tasman 2050. And the candidates have received these questions beforehand. Each candidate will have two minutes to respond to the question and we will be strict with time. Gillian and I might look like soft grandmothers, but we're, we're tough timekeepers. <laughs> <laughs> so when you hear time's up, you need to stop. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, we ask you to keep to the point uh, and respect the fact that people joining us want to hear your views on climate and biodiversity on this evening. And it's okay to pass if you don't want to address a question. The remaining third of the time will be spent on questions from participants. And please type your questions into the chat box and we'll pick them up from there. And please, please uh, participants do forgive us in advance if we don't manage to cover all the questions that you put. Um, and the chat box is at the bottom of your screen uh, <clears throat> if you hover your mouse down. Um, and before we go on, we will ask uh, participants, not candidates, but we ask participants to mute uh, yourselves. Um, so our lineup tonight is Christine McKenzie, John O'Trolove, Mike Kinnanmonth, Kevin Woodley and missing at the moment are Dan Robinson and Dan Shalcrass. What, what I'll do in response to that is um, allow, allow a bit more time for you. If the others join us, I'll have to cut that back. Um, but, but since they're not here, I'll allow you a little bit more time for, for questions, which in a way is good. Uh, we're recording this session 
and uh, we, are, we are putting the recordings up on the Nelson Tasman Climate Forum website. Uh, and a, a number of people at the festival today asked about that. So I'm uh, assuming that, that um, you'll, you'll get hearings for your, your views and opinions beyond this evening. People will be going to the website and um, checking in to, uh, to uh, understand your, your views on things. Okay, so Gillian will be timekeeper for this round of question one where we'll ask you to tell us who you are and what are your outstanding credentials in the arena of action on climate and biodiversity. And we will start with Christine for this round. Thank you. Before you start the time, I probably should just declare that uh, a, a declaration of interest because on behalf of TDC, I am a trustee for the Tasman Environment Trust, so I uh, so I probably should should declare that. Um, all right, Kira Tato. So look, um, many of you know me. Uh, I'm Christine McKenzie. Um, I'm not sure I've got outstanding credentials, but I have had a 25 year career as a Deputy Director General in the Department of Conservation as a Chartered Accountant. Um, you know, I could have worked anywhere but I chose to work for DOC. And why did I do that? Um, I did that because actually um, we have lost so much of our indigenous biodiversity here in New Zealand, 4,000 threatened species. Um, we need to protect them because actually uh, it's our nature that sustains us as human beings. And uh, we need to protect our biodiversity for its intrinsic value, but we also need to protect it for what it might lock into the future, particularly in terms of um, medicines. Um, interestingly enough, I was uh, in the Ecology Action Group when I was a teenager at high school, and I, I don't often think about that, but um, my interest goes back a long way. Um, Four years ago, my family and I purchased a 15 hectare property in Fox Hill. Um, and uh, this, I'm really saying this because it's about um, living and breathing what, what you really, what your values are. Um, we've planted five hectares in native vegetation. Uh, we've replaced fences with um, future posts that are made from recycled milk bottles. Uh, we've put in solar panels. We've built resilience into our water supply, and actually we have an EV. But actually, more importantly, I'm a mother and I'm a grandmother. So, you know, what more motivation is it than that to actually, um, you know, look after our natural environment? And, uh, and just lastly, before I run out of time, it's a, oh, and by the way, I did vote against allowing the Targa rally. So um, just getting that out there on the record. Thank you. Okay, we'll go now to Jono. Unmute yourself, Jono. Unmute himself. Well, um, for, for a start, thank you for um, organizing us to come along, um, Joanna and Gillian. Uh, I will give you a brief description of who I, who I am. Hi, I am Jono Troller. I'm standing for the Motory Waimea Ward, as we know. I am 56 years old, married with four children. I have a background in agriculture and business. Because of my agricultural background, climate and climate change has been something I've paid a lot of attention to over the years. It affects me, or has in the past as a farmer, in two ways. In a business sense, in terms of profitability and sustainability, and in a personal sense. And this is really my living environment and the ex existential threat to my children and my children's children's future. So I have a very, I have a very, a very strong interest in, and, and I've seen uh, climate change over, the over my short life. So um, it's, it is disturbing. One of the major threats to flora and fauna is the creation of large industrial monocultures <laughs> that leave no room for biodiversity. I believe there is now widespread acceptance biodiversity is essential for species survival and farming businesses are changing practices to meet this challenge. I guess in summary, as a 
farmer and someone who spends a lot of recreation time in the outdoors. I believe I'm well placed to understand climate, climate change and bio biodiversity risks. I, as I said, I've personally seen climate change. Uh, three weeks ago, I was I happened to be, I was lucky enough to be ski touring up at the Plateau Hut on Mount Cook. And, you know, the, 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 uh, the glacier there, the, the Tasman Glacier, and we're on the, um, it's escaped me the name, but is, is, is deteriorated hugely. It's very, very obvious in our lifetime what's happening. One other thing I'd just like to say, and, and I, think it's, I think it's underestimated often by the general public, how passionate farmers and people involved in agricultural rural people are about the environment they live in. Often they're seen as the baddies. And uh, I think there's a, there's a percentage of that group that, that don't play by the rules, but I think there's a whole lot more very passionate people who are very disturbed about the way things are changing. And that really about sums up my kind of introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Jono. We'll now go to Mike. Hi, people, and thank you for uh, putting me on your site tonight. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Christine for saying no to the Target Rally. I would have done the same as well. I'm sorry to have broached into your area here, Christine, but I agree that it's a waste of time. I'm, I don't envy, have any outstanding credentials when it comes to climate change, um, but I have a passion for the climate for the environment and that's what I want to see moving forward that we leave today's world in better condition than it was when we started and that our <coughs> Tamariki, our grandchildren and children's children have a better climate to work with. I've seen climate change and global warming for that go from what was a moral duty to do to now the government's got legislation and putting in place enforceable laws and acts that we have to work through. And I really appreciate that. I suppose uh, I have done uh, trapping for the, the battle for the banded rail, and I've also done some tree planting. I'm sorry, I'm a new guy in this, in this block here, but I've got passion and a want to make it happen going forward. So I know I haven't used up in two or three minutes, but that's me from the heart. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And Kelvin, and unmute yourself, Kelvin. Kia ora, Kelvin Woodley. Uh, uh, just recently uh, resigned as principal of Tapawira Area School. Uh, I've spent uh, 40, 40 years teaching kids, um, teaching students, leading schools and all sorts of environmental uh, tasks. Uh, Tapawira School was involved in the, in the blue duck, uh, the protecting the habitat. Um, yeah, always an interest in, in the outdoors and, and uh, environment. Um, I guess I guess I, uh, one of the concerns I have around the, the topic is that uh, oftentimes the wealthy can buy into, into the thing. Uh, you know, they can afford to buy an EV or, or they can afford to, to uh, put solar panels on their house, but the, but the poor often are excluded from these things and, and then are often left struggling with old cars, with, with outdated technology and not able to buy them. So, you know, in all the debate, I'd like to see ways of, of where, where we can make sure that everybody can access the benefits of these things. Um, I guess I'm, I'm concerned for the, the, the long-term direction uh, that, that uh, particularly transportation around our district, district happens. We keep building fricking roads and making it possible for more people to travel greater distances to get to work. and. I don't see that as a, as a sustainable future, especially not when they've all got to go through the Queen Street lights in order to get to work, you know? Um, so there are a whole lot of, in my mind, quite practical things that, that need to be addressed and, and nobody seems to be addressing them. They just keep building more roads. Um, and uh, I think we almost need to let the, let the gridlock just grind to a halt so that people actually get out of the cars and are forced in a sense. Um, to yeah, I mean, I, I actually think that we should um, look big, big time and and at, and construct a uh, a light rail, literally from Attawai to to Wakefield, right through through the town. It's a it's a very linear province, um, 
and then a branch out to, to Mapua. And, and with that way, we could get rid of a whole lot of cars that are, that are transporting kids to school, a whole lot of buses that are transporting kids to school. And uh, yeah, those sorts of things. But, uh, but you know, that, that's, that's big thinking and it takes courage and someone who's, who's it's a long-term commitment that becomes necessary. And uh, I, don't, I don't see long-term commitment. I see three-year thinking, uh, three-year thinking through to what's going to get me to the next election. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's solving these problems is going to take, take much greater commitment than that. Thank, thank you, Kelvin. Um, now I am seeing that Gillian has gone off. So I'll, I'll, uh, Gillian and I plan to alternate until Gillian comes on. I'll uh, carry on uh, with, with question two. Uh, which has to do with um, general response to climate change. So the climate change, uh, the climate crisis clearly requires urgent and significant changes in how we live. And I'm, uh, we'll, we're asking you to describe a climate relevant change that you would launch through council in the next three years if you're elected. And we will start this time with Jono. Uh, okay. Well, I, I guess, you know, for me, uh, the things that, I mean, we've got to start small, unfortunately. So the, the things that sort of piqued my interest and I think the things that we ought to be moving with are um, firstly, the encourage urban intensification uh, with incentives and regulatory change, possibly rate relief even as an incentive, removing some of the compliance costs that, that, that make this difficult, make intensification difficult, such as height restrictions and various other code of compliance regulations, we may be able to make things easier for people who want to build intensify in, in the urban areas. Um, recycling, um, I, I'm really quite interested. I, I'm not sure it's a, it's a large issue as far as it would be a huge saving in sort of, it, in um, carbon expenditure, but uh, I, I'm really interested in, in the landfills, capping the landfills. I know we've got one capped landfill, uh, I'd like to see the others done, and I'd like to see the offtakes used in some sort of productive commercial way uh, to power se essential services, ideally. Um, I would like to see an investigation into the possibilities of um, uh, burning waste at very high temperature and using the gas takeoffs for good rather than just putting everything in a landfill. I think there's, there's, I think there's a few options around waste that haven't really been investigated. Um, I'd like to see uh, more access corridors uh, separating vehicle traffic from cycles and uh, electric commuters, etc. Um, I think that is a sensible and quite an easy solution to avoiding some of the car time. Uh, greening council buildings, uh, that, that seems to be a sensible option. We're talking solar panels and electric vehicles for council. These are quite achievable things. Uh, public transport improvement and a wider distribution of public transport if possible. And one of the other ones I think is overlooked, and again, it seems quite small, but I'm really interested in this idea of recycling construction waste. I think this is something that can be achieved quite easily with a bit of regulation and a bit of forethought. So those are uh, things. Look. Excellent. Time's up. Thank you, Jono. That's that okay. was a that was a good list. Okay. Thank you and welcome to Dan Robinson. Um, we'll get 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 to you, up to you in a moment, Dan. Um, Mike, oh yes, Mike is next on um, changes, climate relevant changes that you will launch through council in the next three years if elected? If elected, I'll hold this book up. Ah, recognize that. <laughs> um, I've read this and this is stunning. This is so good. It should be in every household because that, that sets the tone for where we're going to go. Together with that, is the TDC Climate Change Action Plan. Together, this is why I would see the future. And I've also got this here, which is, I don't know whether you can see that. That is a climate change strategy 
from Nai, Nai Tahu. So in there, there'll be one single feat, some action that we can do right now to get something traction, get it moving. We can't do it all on our, on our own. We're going to bring people with us. So that's where we get out there and do as much as we can, publicizing it, even to the extent where we go along to the community association like Christine does and bring that up every month, keep climate change in front of people. We've got to take we've got to take ownership of it. And with gathering momentum, we can do it all together. So that's my issues, my what I'll do in the next three years and implement all the action points in those blocks and laws. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mike. And, and now, Dan, welcome, and we are up to you. And the, quest, the question is to describe a climate relevant change that you'll launch through council in the next three years if elected. And un, unmute yourself, Dan. Sorry, I didn't realize that it was me doing the unmuting there and I apologize for my tardiness with the, the meeting tonight. Thanks very much, uh, Joanna, for, for hosting this um, and welcome to my, my lounge in Stoke here. Um, to, um, to talk specifically to the question that you've, you've outlined there, I don't know that I actually have a climate specific um, you know, policy that I would look to action in the next three years. I, um, I believe that there's already a a, um, you know, a document that um, does uh, guide council and that is going to require some legs on it uh, to get done um, and may, you know, may take some time and energy to actually uh, see those things happen. So um, that would be my answer to that specific question. Thank you, Dan. And Kelvin, your, your answer on this one. Uh, kia ora. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess for me, um, that my my concern is we can talk about talk about a lot of fairly highfalutin um, things, but I mean, on my run this morning, I picked up a, a plastic drink bottle, a, a beer a beer bottle, and 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 then a, a broken beer bottle on my on my run this morning, and I, I just think, you know, if we can't even do those very simple basic things about looking after our environment, and that's in a river environment, I was running. Um, if we can't even do those, but get those basic things, then we're talking about pie in the sky, really. Um, and I, I just think a, a, a huge emphasis on really basic stuff. Um, another simple thing, um, it, it took me three attempts uh, arriving just before five o'clock, um, two twice, on uh, to, to, to drop off some uh, scrap metal that I had collected from a client I was working with last week. Um, and you get to, the, get to the gate of the place, simple stuff. Get to the gate of the place, and it's ten to ten to five the first day. It was five to five the second day, and the gate is across and it's closed. And the and the drop off bin that used to be accessible um, is no longer accessible, and it, it, you have to drive in and around the back to drop off your scrap metal. There's simple things that that prevent people from doing the very basic stuff that that uh, protects and assists their environment. And I think those basic things need to be sorted out. And then if you if you take that to the next level. I get, I get really concerned about, you know, what happens to that recycled waste? I mean, where is it actually going? And if we're, if we're transporting that stuff halfway around the world in order for it to actually be recycled, which I understand we were for, for a long period of time, tra transporting it to China, um, then, you know, we're actually defeating the whole purpose of the thing. And I, I believe we should have, should be developing uh, small localised um, recycling operations which produce products or or at least uh, bring things down to manageable sizes for transportation to be to be reused in other ways but um, I guess I'm a, I'm a fairly basic uh, practical sort of a human being and I, I just think we need to get those those basic things right thank you Kelvin um, time's yeah. time's up oh. um, on to Chris apologies Joanna my um, laptop just uh, broke completely broke down <laughs> oh you poor dear I'm, I'm really happy to see you there again we're just we're just fini finishing up this round with Christine yep super super thanks all right thank you um 
So we recently had a workshop at the TDC with um, some of the youth from the colleges. And the idea of the workshop was actually to gather ideas for the refresh of the TDC Climate Action Plan. Now, one idea I put into that workshop, because it was we were allowed to be blue skies thinking, is that why could we not have a vision for this district to be a zero waste district? I mean, we can talk about recycling, but actually we want to stop this ridiculous amount of packaging and consumerism in the first instance so that the recycling doesn't even become a thing because we don't have it in here. So, um, I, you know, I'm not sure how it would go in launching it, but I did put it into the workshop. You know, in my heart, I would like to think that the power lies with the consumer to actually be able to bring about change. I mean, why do we buy that stuff with all that packaging on it? It's, it is ridiculous, I say that word again. We need to lobby central government. I mean, it's great the changes that they're bringing in in October with, with all the things that we're not going to have, um, but we need more of that, actually. Imagine um, zero waste Tasman, you know, would be great. I'm sure we could all get behind that. So um, anyway, that's my idea. Excellent, Christine, thank you. Uh, over to Gillian for the next question, and I'll be timekeeper for this one. Thank you. Um, they estimate that about 90% of our um, local CO2 emissions are from transport. And the question is, what will you do to help reduce transport emissions, building on what TDC has started? So, um, uh, who is... Oh, uh, we should start with Mike in this round. Okay, thank you. Mike, can I move? It's all right, I just lost you for a second or two. Um, well, some of you will know that I'm already heavily involved in the Mapua Residents Association. And we've got a lovely lady there called Lana Meredith who is trying to get Mapu Willing Wheels up and running, which is a very audacious sort of uh, concept of getting people to share rides and go into a like a, a taxi arrangement between Machuaka, Mapu, and Richmond. And they've had funding, they've sourced the vehicle, they've got the drivers there, they just need bums on seats. And this is one way that we can start reducing our need to stay inside our tin can cars going from A to B. And I'm just the other day I was saying to Elena that she needs to promote it more so that more people use it. So that is one way that we can start reducing our CO2 emissions by getting into a, a bus or a, um, a regional bus route, which is what the regional transport uh, strategy is looking at as well. So. That's one of my first ones that I'd push further and probably promote more and get more buy-in from the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, Dan Robinson, what what would you specifically do as a councillor to help reduce transport emissions? Mm, so I think the first thing has probably already been been spoken about tonight is investigating the public transportation options that might be available. I think um, with public transportation, I've had people talking to me about it, not really from the environmental perspective, but just the actual um, filling a need that people have perspective. So um, I think there might actually be some win-win if the options, you know, um, work out so that people actually use them around the district. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Kelvin, what would you do to reduce um, CO2 emissions from transport locally? Well, well for, for a start, I'm not sure that, that uh, one vote, one councillor is perhaps enough to achieve anything on my own, um, but, but uh, certainly I, uh, uh, the, there's a need for us to I mean, just you know, if you just look at it on a really basic level, purely from a, a, a traffic jam 
um, perspective, we, we need to do something. And I, I, and I don't believe the solution is ever to build more roads. So some smarter roads might be, might be in order, some better positioned roads might be in order. And I understand that NZTA is a major player in, the, in that. But uh, as I said in my introduction, I, I, I believe we need to look to alternatives. I, I do not believe buses are a satisfactory alternative because they sit in traffic jams just like everything else. I believe that bicycles are, are an important alternative, but once again, but, but they are dependent upon people living in the right places. Um, uh, I, I have I have a, a belief that we should have light rail available. Uh, I, I know of a story of, of Fremantle that when Fre the Fremantle Township was was developed, everybody was travelling in cars, and and uh, and as it grew, the the, the motorway uh, just became log jammed. And uh, then people started to notice that the train went whistling past because the train doesn't get caught in log jam in, in traffic jams. And then people started to use the trains, which previously had been running empty or near to empty or low, low volumes anyway. And, and that's the sort of long-term um, determination that it would take to get people out of cars. You have to put, a, you have to put a service in place and then stick with it for years uh, and, uh, until people wake up and realise, and, and, and also just where they live and how they live, so that they can use uh, that, sort of, that sort of transport. It needs to be uh, friendly so they can take their scooters and take their push bikes on, and they hop on and they hop off and ride to the, the last distances. Um, I, I, I guess fixing it, trying to fix it with small tinkering with bus routes and things is is just it's it's only tinkering at the edges it's, we, it's got to be big thinking associated with that thank you kelvin um christine thank you Gillian. um so in my role as a councillor over the last three years i have supported and will continue to support investment in public transport you probably all know that this is ramping up from the first of july next year it's fantastic I was part of the hearing panel that heard the public su submissions and deliberated on the recommendations in the recently approved walking and cycling strategy. And actually I'm on the governance group for the Streets for People initiative. And this is where we actually develop and implement the program of work to make that walking and cycling strategy come alive. But you know, it's gonna take courage to stick with that and, uh, and I can already see some cracks appearing. Um, you know, people are very wedded to their parking spots um, outside their houses. And, uh, and actually, you know, I think we need councillors who are prepared to be courageous and actually make a, make a shift because um, it's really important in terms of creating those environments where people can walk and cycle and get out of their cars. And I wanted to just talk about something else as well. And um, recently, the Wakefield School Board of Trustees approved recapitation of Wakefield Primary School. Now, this is really important because it means that the, the kids stay in the school there um, for years seven and eight instead of getting in a bus or getting in a car and getting driven into Richmond. So instead of having all these rural kids in cars, having to drive much further distances to go to school, keep it local. Actually, utilize the assets that are already there, provide community facilities so that kids can actually stay in their local communities. And actually, I think that that has a big impact on um, reduction in emissions. And then I was a strong advocate, um, I see that, Julie's on the on the call there. I was a strong advocate actually for that recapitation process. Thank you. Kia ora. Um, no, no, what would you um, specifically do to help reduce transport emissions? Okay. Um, look, I, I had a look through the Tasman Climate Action Plan and um, they, they have got some initiatives around transport in there, which I think are pretty worthy. They've got more EV charging stations, pretty minimal, uh, increased public transport, incentives to use alternative transport, and continued investment in new and existing active transport. I, I just don't, I don't think I see, I, 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 worthy ideas, but I don't think we're seeing the results of them yet. Maybe it's too early a days, but I, I'd be, I, I think they're really good ideas. I would personally like to see a bigger push in active and public transport, uh, the safe corridors for active transport, um, and a broadened public transport network if we could. And I think there needs to be a strong media campaign behind a lot of these things to try and get people to take them up. 
Um, in the case of public transport, I think we just have to accept that it's going to be very unprofitable for a long period of time before people take it up. And, and we've just got to accept that and wear it until it becomes commonly used. Um, and really, that's that's about it for me, actually. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, uh, Sarah, Mike, uh, did we start with you? We did, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think everyone's done that one. Yep. Uh, yeah, Brad. Thank Mike's ideas weren't acceptable. He has to go again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. We're going to fire, we'll fire another one at you now, and, uh, and Gillian will be the timekeeper. This one's on urban intensification, which has become essential to cut our vehicle kilometres per person, uh, which in Tasman are among the highest in the world. Uh, the uh, Tasman District Council Future Development Strategy provides for large housing subdivisions on agricultural land. What will you do on council to shift the focus to building more homes in town? And we will start with Dan for this one. Okay, thank you. So, um, so what I've heard on the street, I haven't investigated it myself, but um, currently I think there's been a change with the urban planning around Richmond, which is the biggest population area that we have in the district, um, to allow this type of activity to already take place. I think that's that is council's role to actually be changing changing the zoning appropriately to allow for the type of urban intensification that um, would be needed. Uh, also, I, I I I'm not really a fan of council being directly involved in developments that they might own. That's that's not something I'm for, but um, definitely in allowing these things to take place, I see council as having a crucial role in that. And I'm gonna be interested to see um, how the developers in Richmond respond to these changes. So for anyone that knows that better, please correct me if I've got it wrong. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. To Kelvin now. Um, I, as I've said at some of the meet candidate meetings, I, I believe that people are very good at coming up with solutions. And I, I believe it's the role of the council to facilitate and support those solutions, uh, as long as they're not, you know, dangerous in some way or, or a health risk or whatever. But if, so if people want to put a, a tiny house on their property, as long as it's not uh, impinging over, overly on the, the neighbours, then there, there should be a, a, a tolerance for that. Uh, it just makes sense. Um, I've been heartened, we've been looking at houses recently and, and I've been heartened to see a, a number of properties we've looked at that have got uh, a second tiny, not a tiny home, but like a, a, a studio or a one bedroom unit on them. And I think that's the type of logical thing that can be fitted into many places, not all of them, but many properties could take a, a studio, a one bedroom unit on the back without, without changing dramatically the the living conditions of the place. I, I do have some concerns um, uh, around over intent, what I would see is over intensification. Whilst the, what the properties are new, they, they, they are flash and sweet and everything's good, but 20, 30 years down the track, uh, the, there can be a risk that they become, um, well, slums, I suppose, you know, lower, lower cost, lower, because the people, once they get a bit of money behind them, they often don't want to live on top of one another and, and they have it if they have a choice they'll move out to somewhere else and and I, I, I get concerned about that I saw a lot of that in Christchurch when I was growing up uh, that was that was concerning mm. thank you Kelvin to Christine now on urban intensification thank you Joanna um so as you probably all know following on from the <coughs> approval of the future development strategy an implementation plan will be developed. Now, one idea that we have started to talk about in the council is that TDC could become a facilitator of land aggregation. So this is, this is where, for example, in an urban environment, you know, a section here might become available and then a section here. So instead of allowing those individually 
to be developed for intensification. You hold the land until you can get the properties in between or around. And then you can have a much more blue skies intensification effort instead of trying to just intensify on one section alone. So I'm interested in the idea of that. And, uh, and I think that it potentially um, has merit. Um, now, I think there's another idea as well, um, which I can also understand, you know, across Tasman, we've got a lot of rural residential development. So they, this is a single house on a very large area of land. They provide their own water and deal with their own wastewater. But maybe, maybe we've got enough of that. And actually, instead of having more sprawling rural residential, we need to hold that back until at such time as we can have um, much more intensification on those areas. In terms of planning and consenting, we all know it needs to be easier and quicker. But, you know, with consenting, it's jolly hard to attract staff. So TDC needs to be an employer of choice. We need to look after our staff. We need to supply them with good working conditions because otherwise we're in this terrible situation where you've got a lot of work to be done and no one to actually do the work, which is what we're facing at the moment. So um, there's a few ideas, I think. Thank you. Um, and now to Jono. Yes, well, I, I think, you know, urban intensification is, is, is the obvious solution to a lot of these things. But then again, of course, not everyone wants, wants to live in, a, in, in an urban area that's been fully intensified. So we have these sort of conflicting problems. I see the uh, future development strategy is mo mostly focused around urban intensification and along the main thoroughfares. Um, I, I think to encourage urban intensification, we need to look at the regulations and make it simpler, uh, it, and not only uh, make it regulatory simpler, but also incentivise intensification if we can, by lowering rates possibly and reducing compliance fees for people who want to build another dwelling on, on their particular property. Um, and I think when you're confronted with urban intensification, you know, the, the, this feeds into the whole living environment in an urban area. It has to be uh, conducive to us wanting to live in that area. And this, of course, nicely dovetails into a lot of the other sort of environmental issues within, within the urban area. You, we need the greening and the parks. So I think it all kind of comes together a wee bit if we want to achieve urban intensification. Uh, the other thing, obviously, we, we can't avoid some greenfield developments because uh, the, the purely demand as much as anything else. I think it's very important these are done in the right areas. And I, I think maybe this hasn't been thought about as much as it should be. I think there's plenty of lower productive land that could be could be used for uh, greenfield developments that maybe hasn't been fully considered. Thanks. Thank you, Jono and Mike on urban intensification. If I can start with a little story. This afternoon, my wife dragged me down to the greengrocer in Mapua. And I was talking to Jared about his vegetables and he was complaining about the cost of vehicles, vegetables coming into him is going up and up because the land which has been used to grow the vegetables is now so expensive to maintain that people are now, uh, developers are coming in and looking to build on it. And he's getting his potatoes from Auckland for God's sake. So we're growing potatoes in Auckland for Nelson. That is absolutely wrong. We've got to stop that. We've got to say, right, okay, we've got productive land where we're growing our vegetables. That's it. It's growing our vegetables. Once we've got a house on that soil, it's gone forever. So we've got to allow in our building consent and um, resource management processes that soil that is good for growing vegetables is set aside for that. And if it means it gets discounted rates, that's fine, I'm happy with that. With intensification, I think it should be a tiered system. So we should have the ability to knock down an old house and put two one bedroom hat, uh, flats on it, like we used to do in the 60s and 70s and have a garage in the middle if need be, but then start going up and up. I've also been involved with the Seton Valley subdivision from on behalf of the Marpo Residents Association. And the developer there was saying, well, but we can put one or two bedroom houses in a little cluster here and here. Well, no, because sometimes 
people want a house, one or two bedroom beside or somewhere close to their family. So there's no reason why we can't have one or two one bedroom, one or two bedroom houses spread throughout the subdivision. So that once again comes down to town planning rules that we we as councillors and council can make. Lastly, how about this for something different? That we offer a building consent rebate for people who are building an eco-friendly and sustainable house. So not Thank just you, meeting Mike. the standard. I'm afraid your time's up. Sorry, oh. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Mike. Okay, over to Gillian for biodiversity. <clears throat> Um, this this question is um, asking about uh, council use of land it already owns um, and making um, more innovative use of that land for conservation purposes to increase biodiversity. And we'll start with um, Kelvin on this question. Um, kia ora. Obviously, the, the the difficulty with the, this is that every time you enter into another program, it's, it, it adds cost. Uh, the money's got to come from somewhere. It comes from ratepayers in this case. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I have no no issue with council. It, it makes sense. Um, if they already own land, it makes sense to, to make the best possible use of it. And uh, we need to create environments, all sorts of environments, and, and enhance all sorts of environments if they exist. I and mean, I'm not sure exactly what what land council actually holds that would fit under some of these categories, you know, uh, pond, pond, water and, and wetland restoration. Um, I don't know what the council owns, but um, certainly if they own those things, you're not going to be wanting to build facilities on them. So it makes sense to work with local groups to um, enhance the, the natural environments. Uh, on, a, in another, on another level, I often have wondered why we always plant uh, in our parks and, and areas, uh, exotic import, uh, trees rather than planting fruit trees or nut trees or you know stuff that actually produces food. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know why that's not done, but it seems to me a logical thing that could easily be done uh, in, in a lot of our park areas that, that are, would hardly make any difference to the care of them. You'd still be able to mow around them just like every other tree. So a um, bit of diversification that could happen there with little effort. Thank you, Kelvin. Um, next is Christine to um, just tell us how you think uh, council could make more innovative use of council land for conservation. Yeah, okay, thanks, Gillian. Well, um, I think what the council needs to do firstly is it needs to do a good job of managing the biodiversity on the reserves that it's already got. Um, and, um, and actually on that topic, you know, I do want to acknowledge the brilliant efforts of volunteers um, because actually, you know, if we look at what's happened in Dominion Flats and around the Waimea Inlet, fantastic projects and, uh, and actually I would really support the council putting more money into volunteer groups and leveraging actually what it gets for its dollar. Um, I actually think that, um, you know, we've had a lot of talk um, up in Kingsland Forest there behind Richmond. We're actually retiring plantation forest and we're putting some of that into, um, into native and also other tree species. Um, I look at what the council's done in Bork Creek down on Lower Queen Street, where you've actually got, um, you know, kind of like a greenway that provides for stormwater, it become a become a restoration site for biodiversity and it can also provide for recreation opportunities. So I think the council is actually thinking quite in quite an innovative way around, around what it does. Um, um, urban greening, you know, it's always the right tree in the right place. I've had some terrible conversations with residents who have got the wrong tree um, in the wrong place in an urban environment. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's probably about it from me for that one. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> and Jono, what are your ideas on this question? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I think there could be a bit more innovation around, especially around conservation and recreation in, 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 our, in the council estate. Um, 
I see huge opportunities for collaboration between business, local council, and environmental and recreation groups to do some of this work rather than it all be uh, subject to the ratepayers' uh, expense. I, I really think everyone, there's, there's a lot of community goodwill in this area that could be exploited, I feel. Um, I think uh, some of the council land closer to the urban environment could certainly be, be reviewed. Um, this, is, this helps in two ways. It helps with intensification, but it also um, would make a more pleasantly livable environment. I'd like to see a bit of a review of the uh, forestry aspects close to the urban areas. I know they're used at the moment for cycleways and walkways, but there's a real opportunity, I think, maybe to remove some of that from the forest rotation, and that might include more, more of Rabbit Island as well, and, and bring in the more biodiverse, um, more native plantings, more biodiversity across those areas. Um, Really, I think that's probably the, the simplest one to do is make use of the stuff that's handy to the urban areas. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mike, what what um, what do you think? Um, how do you think council could make more innovative use of um, the land for increasing biodiversity? Well, if we're only talking about council land, and that narrows it down a little bit. Um, my wife and I are members of the banded rail, and so we do a lot of trapping, and she's got two trapping lines around the Waimea Inlet. And Steve Richards, I presume some of you know him from the TDC, has been very, very good in offering advice, assistance, and plants out of the four billion trees that the government is offering as well. So I echo what uh, Christina's saying, build partnerships with the voluntary organisations that's already underway and keep going what we're doing. Don't stop. And um, when it comes to pond water retention, that's probably a stormwater type issue. Uh, I've been mixed up in that in the Christchurch City Council, but we'll talk about that later on. So that's my two pennies worth. Thank, Thank you. you, Mike. Um, and Dan. Yeah, I'm going to go. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm for innovation, so I, I would um, be very interested to see what great ideas come up about the use of council land. If you'll allow it, I'd like to yield the remainder of my time to Mike to cover his uh, rebate um, uh, idea that he didn't get to finish before, if you'll allow it. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, we, we'll allow that. Uh, thanks, Dan, for dropping me in it. Um, so we're talking about the rebate for the eco-friendly sustainable housing. Well, has anyone really put our uh, building consent in and find out how much it costs? I tried to get three signs put up in Mapua, and it was $1,500 for three signs for a year. That, so that was a consent. So we must be able to offer some sort of discount for eco-friendly sustainable homes go quadruple um, windows instead of double glazing make it three in there offer if somebody comes up with a, an idea that's um, more eco-friendly keeps the house warmer and drier why not give them some sort of discount to try it out give them give the entrepreneurs give them the people who've got these good ideas a go and make it easy for them so that's, that's me done. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Nice, nice example of cooperation there, eh, Gillian? <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're we're um, about, about two thirds of the way through. And at this point, it would be really good to ask uh, those, those participating if they have any questions. I think uh, uh, we don't have any written in chat yet and so we'll just ask you to uh, put up your hand either your physical hand or your little icon hand that you'll find at the bottom um, you you can put up that icon hand anytime we have more questions um, on our on our question sheet so we're not short of questions to challenge the candidates, but we also do do want to allow um, the the uh, participants to question uh, ask questions. 
Okay, we have one written into the chat from David Bartle. And David would like to know, many TDC voters don't think climate change is a priority. Please specify what winning arguments you'd use to get a controversial council initiative into force. Cycleways, bus subsidies, zero waste are, are David's examples of controversial policies. So he's asking for um, your the, the winning arguments that you might you might put forward, um, and you know po possibly this could be brief if 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 possible. And I think we're ready to start with Christine again. Oh, okay. So I'm answering that question from David. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, you know, uh, what an interesting question. Um, gosh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm about evidence-based decision-making. So I think my brief answer would be show the data. Sounds good. Okay. On to Jono. Well, I, I kind of think I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer this by saying I think you, it needs wide publicity, and this is the thing. You know, it, it's more that people aren't really aware of the issues. I think I think there's enough drama and enough terror when they know the facts. And I think it's a lot about publicity, and I think a good place to start is in the school. You get those schools fully revved up, and it always filters through to the home. I think that's a good place to start. Okay, it, uh, an interesting answer. Um, Mike. Um, I'd like to continue on from Jono's comments as well and to say, if we've got a controversial one, and I've, and I've dealt with a bit of controversy over the years, it's about education. Tell them what's good for the people and what's good for them. They're going to get something out of it. Everybody wants something for themselves. So if you publicize it and promote it properly, they will come along with you and and they'll ride the wave like we're on at the moment. That's me. Thank you. Dan. So I'd start by saying, you know, things that are controversial are controversial for a reason. Um, there's, there's probably, you know, lots of sides to the story. I don't see any of the examples that you use there as being terribly controversial. Uh, maybe they are, maybe I'm out of touch with the ratepayers. Um, but um, yeah, I, I wouldn't probably start with, you know, um, education in schools. I prefer more what Mike suggested about educating uh, the public. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, it is a, a balancing act that you've got to figure out with these controversies. So I would probably take Christine's evidence-based approach. Thanks. Thank, thank you. And Kelvin. Uh, schools are, are overwhelmed with with the amount of expectation that the community puts on them. I can tell you that from 40 years in there, we're constantly being asked to teach this, to teach that, to promote this, to promote that. And um, the, unless you actually have a teacher in the school who champions it, uh, you're doomed to fail because um, it's just another thing that the, the teachers have to do. Uh, I'm, I'm also, I've got, I've got question marks over whether central government is the place to put it. I, I think uh, central government making legislative changes, um, that tends to put people's backs up. And so it does come back to uh, promoting things in a, in a public sense. Uh, zero waste, for example. Uh, what does that look like? You know, how do, how do, we, how do we convince manufacturers uh, to, to change their, their packaging uh, systems. Uh, I, th I think, the, the, you see, because the, the capitalist world, uh, you know, if there's a dollar in it, then, then that's what we'll do. If this is how we package things, then that's what we do, and, and if it sells it. Uh, and so, you know, zero waste, I, I think there's better ways of going about that, and it's, it's got to start from a grassroots movement with the people. Uh, sim you simply stop buying, you know, the, the, the tooth face with the fluoride in it that's packaged and you know this or that or, or whatever and you, you you have to just keep promoting that and working on that and uh yeah um let it 
let it build naturally, I suppose. Um, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Kelvin. Over to Gillian. I think you will find a new question in the chat box. Thank you. Well, the the, um, the new <coughs> question, if you could revisit the future development strategy next year, what would be on your wish list? So uh, let's start with Jono. Right, well, I, I, I'm not hugely familiar with it, but um, I know that uh, what happened was a lot of the sort of, uh, a lot of the greenfield development was rejected, or, as I understand it, or, or wasn't carried forward, except possibly for the Tasman area, around the Tasman township. And I, and I think that, look, I'm, I'm not necessarily opposed to greenfield development, so I would like to see a bigger investigation of greenfield development in more in, in what I would call the unproductive horticultural land. I, I think there is room, it's just finding finding the right places. So I think that could be, be looked at a bit more hard and harder and a bit harder in the future development plan. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, Mike. Um, first of all, the FDS it slips through in my mind very quietly without a lot of engagement from the ratepayers in the community. I think a lot of it's been rolled over from what was there before. The, um, the spatial plan is the next thing on our list to have a look at that is looking at intensification, town planning rules and regulations. So I think the FDS should, in the next round of uh, discussions, be open and fully discussed through the communities. That's me. Thanks. Dan? Uh, so uh, if next year we were to uh, revisit the future development strategy, that would probably be the first time I would visit the future development strategy. So I'm not really qualified um, to have a list at all at this stage, I'm afraid. Thank you for the question. <coughs> Thanks. Um, and Kelvin? Uh, I'm a bit like, oh, I'm a bit like Dan, really. Um, but, you know, if, if we're looking into the future and if we could go back 30 years and and say something that I would like to see, I, I would like to see electrified light rails across the district. That's simple as that. Yep, thank you. Christine. Um, gosh, I hope we don't have to since we've just approved it. Um, you know, I voted in support of the current FDS. It was a long process with a large amount of public engagement, over 580 submissions. Um, you know, ideally you don't want greenfields development, you don't want to build on your productive land, but equally you're required by government to have a high level strategy that provides for growth based on your models of your population increases. Um, if there was one thing that I might revisit, it would be updating the population models because I think we're in very dynamic times at the moment in terms of the current kind of economic outlook and maybe we were forecasting too much growth. Um, I don't know, but probably that's the one thing that I would, would re-look at. Yeah, thank you. Interesting. Um, Dono. Oh, we started there, didn't we? We, yeah, yeah, jolly good. We did. <laughs> yeah. So we've got a, another interesting question here, Joanna. So over to you. Right. Um, I just. Uh, okay. Do you want me to... I, I've got it. Um, yep. I'll, I'll give it a go. It is a long question uh, from Fred Overmars. And I'll, I'll go through it. Would you support extending the scope of the current Tasman Climate Action Plan beyond the current council operations only uh, to being a climate action plan for the community? And Fred goes on to say specifically in the regional policy statement specifying an emissions target um, related to the current IPCC 43% reductions target by 2030, 
um, and then bringing that ambition systematically to all areas where the council has agency. Uh, and Fred notes that recently Greater Wellington Council has committed to half greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Uh, and Auckland also has a, a comprehensive climate plan. So the, the question is, would you support taking it from a council operations only plan to a community plan with a, a, a strong target, the target that we need uh, of pretty much halving emissions by 2030. Okay, so for this one, we will start with Mike. I'll put it out there now, and my first thought would be no, because I'm not in a position to be able to tell my neighbour what they're going to do when it comes to reducing emissions. But the council can lead this and show people the way, and I think that's our role, as opposed to telling our, our neighbours and our friends what to do on their property. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. On to Dan. Uh, the same view as Mike, identically. Okay, and Kelvin. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm not. Uh, I'm not qualified to 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 particularly um, make any comment on that. Really. Fair enough. And Christine. Well, <clears throat> you see, I think that the council can do a lot of things that actually would help to achieve a uh, reduction on emissions by the general public without having to actually widen the scope of the plan. I mean, a, a simple example is investing in public transport. Uh, it, it's actually providing for active transport. Um, so I think that the, the council needs to just be focused on where are most of our emissions coming from and what can we do that actually will help the general public to reduce the emissions rather than um, dictating to them. Thank you. And finally on this one, Jono. Right, well, I, I, look, I, I, I don't understand that council really has any control over the community. I'm not sure that we have a mandate to do that at all, to be honest. So I would certainly not be not trying to push the community in any particular way, and I don't think we can. Um, as far as the targets go, I know there's some targets in there, and of course I can't recall them off the top of my head. So I, I possibly he's asking for firmer targets, and um, maybe we're in favour of that, but I think it would be realistic as well. So... Two things there, no to the community, sort of forcing the community in, in any sort of thing. And are these other targets realistic or not? I mean, I just lack the information. Thanks. Thank you, Jono. Um, over to Gillian, who, Gillian, you may want to choose from some of the, our questions that haven't been dealt with yet. Uh, and also just to remind people that um, you, you can uh, write questions into, oh, okay, you've got a question there from Steve Anderson. Um, okay, these figures are as 2021. Total TDC forestry ownership is 2,781 hectares and Kingsland forest is 62 hectares. Kingsland Forest is being held in as an example by TDC of it fighting climate change. That is only 2.2% of total forestry ownership. Can't we do better than that? Um, okay, well, it's an it's a, um, interesting question. Uh, we start with Dan. Um, thanks, Steve, for your question. Um, I'm not sure I understand um, the question. So Kingsland Forest is an example. Um, uh, can we promote better examples? Probably. There's probably better examples that can be um, looked to. Or can we just do better with forestry? Um, sure. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to answer the question, I'm afraid, Steve. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, um, I might be wrong, Steve, so uh, correct me if I am. Um, are you uh, are you using King's Lynn for us as an example of um, a mixed native exotic forest that uh, the intentions are to be not uh, filled? Um, so that contributes to um, uh, fighting climate change. Um, is that I'm assuming that's what that example is. Yes. So, yeah. Yes, as I understand it. Oh. Yes, as I understand it, Kings. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Christine will probably be able to explain it better than me. But um, as I understand it, it's been taken out of production and will um, be planted in a mix of natives and exotics uh, to sequester carbon. Yeah, yep. that, that, that's how I understand it. But like I said, Christine, being on the council, you'll probably understand. But I, the TDC is holding up. That, and it is a great example of what they're doing, but it is a very small proportion of their forestry investments. Yeah. Maybe Gillian, we could just ask, does anyone else want to comment on that one? Yeah, throw it open. Um, yeah, thanks, Christine. Yeah, look, I, I will just provide a comment. I mean, um, I guess the trade-off, um, Steve, that, that comes into this discussion, and, and to be fair, Kingsland wasn't necessarily all about um, uh, carbon sequestration. It, it was to do with, you know, runoff behind Richmond, et cetera, as well. Um, anyway, the trade-off that the council would have to make is its plantation forest, whether it be Howard, Borlase, Rabbit Island, actually is quite has quite a high... Uh, internal rate of return actually generates net millions of dollars back to TDC. Now, um, uh, if in actual fact you were getting carbon credits, I'm not sure that it's gonna be at the same level. If it's not, what happens is people's rates are gonna go up. So I think that's, that's the trade-off. Thanks, Jono. I, I really think there has to be an examination of putting some of this forestry into the ETS. I, I really think, uh, yeah, Christine's all over the numbers, I know that. And um, I know councils in the recent past have raised questions about the profitability of the forestry estate for the council. Uh, from what I've just heard from Christine, I'm reassured that it is a profitable business. But um, I really think the emissions trading scheme needs to be looked at very closely because I believe it would be more profitable than, than, than failing forestry, exotic forestry. Um, whether that, that, that uh, scheme lasts forever, we don't know. So there has to be a bit of risk mitigation in there as well, but it's certainly something we should be looking at. Thanks. Would anyone else like to comment there? Yeah, Mike. Yeah, I agree with Jono and Christine. You know, there is very much profitability in it. And what can we do better than that? Probably have a look at all the other ideas that are uh, causing the emissions problems. I see in a graph here, I've got that 41% um, of gross emissions were from agriculture. So there might be areas in that that we can actually get some runs on the board for want of a better name. So yes, we can do better in, for in forestry, but have a look at what else is causing the emissions and and get some runs on the board, get behind us and get people coming together with us. Thank you. Thank you. And Dan, did you want to contribute here? Um, no, thanks for clearing up the question though. I understand it um, now. And um, yeah, I, I, I would just see this as another balancing act that would need to be considered in terms of what you do with the forestry assets. Thanks. Great. And Joni Tomsett's providers with a, a link to the TDC website to get a bit more information on this. So thank you. Um, how are we going? Uh, I think we've got time for one more question, <clears throat> um, at least. Yeah. And I'm feeling a bit mischievous and going to throw the cat among the pigeons and ask you, 
what are your views on establishing a cat control policy? Uh, okay, where do we start, Gillian? Um, um, I think it's Kelvin. It's Kelvin. Not. Okay, Kelvin, cat control policy. Uh, and let me just, just make a little preamble um, in case it's not completely obvious. Um, the, the health of our biodiversity is definitely threatened by cats. Um, so this is a biodiversity question. Kelvin. Well, well, we have two border collies in our house and we did try to have cats and they, the two of them didn't get to be more than kittens and they both got run over by outside. So we have definite cat control around my house. Uh, I, yeah, look, cats, cats, we know they're, they're born hunters. We know, we know that. And it, it, it does make some sense, uh, I think, to, to have some sort of, um, oh, I guess I prefer a, a light-handed rather than heavy-handed approach to that. I mean, certainly I know of people who, who their cats wear a bell and things like that to, to help minimise, but they, they, are, they are ruthless hunters. We know that. And um, it's unfortunate that, that our bird life is, is so threatened by them, but, um, and I guess the lizards and things as well, I suppose. But um, yeah, I, it's, it's a tricky one because you want people on the one hand to be free to choose. And on the other hand, uh, you want to protect the, the wildlife. And uh, we, do, we already have some areas where, where dogs and cats are excluded. Uh, uh, I believe uh, Rotoiti has, uh, has some exclusions there. So, um, you know, uh, certainly there could be potentially some areas where we could encourage exclusions at the very least, moving towards a complete exclusion. Mm. Thank you, Kelvin. Christine. Love this question. There are two things that have happened at Council in this triennium that I have been super, super disappointed with. And one of them was the decision that was made not to put the CAT bylaw out for public consultation. We employed someone who spent a year writing a bylaw. We had the vets pleading with us to go ahead and put the bylaw out so that through microchipping, they could identify feral cats and put them down. And when it came to the vote, of course, I voted to put the cat bylaw out for public consultation. The vote was lost. I thought it was ridiculous and I was really, really disappointed. And I'm hoping that actually in the next triennium, it'll come back onto the council table. We absolutely should have it as do so many other councils around New Zealand. Thank you, Christine. Jono. Well, I'm going to alienate about 90% of New Zealand and say we should have cat bylaws. And look, I, I, I think it's something that's really underestimated. I mean, I, I know from my, my, in the past, farming experience, et cetera, I've shot countless wild cats. And uh, I, I am a cat lover, but I really... <laughs> They need to be controlled. I'd be very interested in seeing some sort of bylaw passed to reduce them or remove them even um, in the long term. Thanks. Thank you, Jono. Mike. Thank you, Joanna, for dropping me and well, us into this question. Very, um, as a cat lover and a dog lover, and I own a boarding kennel cattery and transported pets around the world, I've seen cats at their worst and I've been scrapped by them. You're trying to um, give a wild feral cat an injection or a pill, uh, the scratches go very deep into you. It's a topic that I don't think you'll get much traction without some legislation. I think, and that's what's needed. And I support Christine before when she said we, did, we needed a bylaw. Of, if I'm voted in, I will certainly be, uh, beside Christine and saying, yes, let's get this going. Um, neutering is another way of um, reducing or optimising the, the feral cats and also microchip. Uh, talk to vets about microchips and while they had some initial problems with them losing them or can't uh, read them, microchip is a way to go. And I think by publicly maybe shaming and blaming some cat owners who are not um, looking after them properly. They put them in a bag and drop them off at um, one of the um, forests around here, which is where our cat came from, is another way too. But I'm definitely supporting 
some control on cats. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And finally, Dan on this one. Yeah, thanks, Joanna. I'm a dog person, um, but I would say I would probably need to see the details around such a proposal before I could uh, conclude on it. I'm sad to hear, Christine, that um, you know these things that time is spent on are not actually put to the public for them to have a say on. That um, concerns me. Thank you. Thank you all. And I, I have to say, I'm quite surprised and impressed by, by the answers on, on this round. Um, I, I'm judging that we don't quite have time for another round uh, of, in answer to a question, but um, we do have time if you want 30 seconds to uh, tell the, the, the people on the screen and also the people who will watch this subsequent in, in subsequent days, um, 30 seconds to let them know something in the arena of climate change and biodiversity that you regard uh, as of great importance to your position. And we shall start with, I actually can't remember, but I'll just go for the middle and start with Mike. And you can pass if you've said everything you want to say, you can pass, but 30 seconds if you want to say something more. And I hope Gillian's got the stopwatch on me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm all for climate change. It is happening. We've had so many, and I've been around various community meetings and people are still saying it's not happening. No, it's, it's all right. Don't worry about it. It is happening. It's in front of us. It's happening with all the frequency of the events of the storms that are happening. We've gone through the moral duty stage. Now government is legislating and it'd be our role in TDC to implement these changes and to push it through. And I'm a firm believer in taking people with us, getting out there, communicating with them, not just sitting in an ivory tower. Thanks, Mike. We're, oh, 30 seconds is up. Crowd's oh, it's pretty, just starting. It's pretty short. <laughs> I maybe I why don't why don't I say 60 seconds? Too? All right, the big heart. <laughs> Carry on, Mike. <laughs> now, what I can say is we've been the the uh, candidates been around the local communities, and so these questions come up there. So please feel free to come and talk to us at these meetings or listen to us. And just we're all singing the same song here, team. This is all about something that's happening around us, and we've got to. Have a, leave this world in a better place than what we started. And that's my 60 seconds. Good on you, Mike. Thank you. All right. Okay, now to Dan. 60 seconds, Dan. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I might have some more room for someone else here. Hey, thanks very much for organising this event. It's been a pleasure uh, to be a part of. Um, I'm not campaigning at all on climate change. Um, I'm campaigning on being reasonable and balanced. Um, and climate change comes into that. Right, so um, it's definitely something that we all have to consider. Um, I'd appreciate it if people want to learn more about me, if they uh, check out my information on my website, there's a link in the chat. Um, and yeah, that's that's everything for me, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Kelvin. Uh, I guess I guess what uh, I'd want to say is that I, I believe all these changes need to be, need to just, just follow through, uh, uh, due democratic process really um i'm i am concerned that uh in our government uh we we have a a lack of uh honoring the due dem democratic process the due consultation with with uh decision making being made at the lowest possible level rather than at, at central levels uh, so whatever happens it needs to have followed a, a an appropriate democratic process yeah Thank you. Thank you. Christine. Thank you. I guess what I would say is that, um, you know, the council has a role and it can do what it can do. As individuals, we can play our part as well. But I really would take my thanks off to the Nelson Tasman Climate Forum because actually uh, you're doing great work and, and you can be much stronger advocates probably and play a greater advocacy role than what even the council might be able to do. So I think, you know, 
there's a lot of us who are really behind the work that you're doing. And so I, I just keep it up. Oh, thank you very much, Christine. That's really nice. Jono. Well, in relation to climate, I think, you know, council needs to lead by example. Uh, we need to bring the science to the debate always. Uh, we need to collaborate across all groups, environmentalists through to farmers, through to council, and we need to work together on this. And we need action. We need action. Uh, we're very good at talking about it. Very little action. And uh, finally, future planning as well. It's happening now. We really need to plan now for the for future. It's going to be very different. And that really is my final say on the climate job. Thank, thank you very much. I, I must say um, this evening has felt like a particular pleasure um, to, to have the candidates here uh, speaking on, on these matters. And thank you all. But first of all, for uh, putting yourselves forward for service to the community uh, and for wrestling with these undoubtedly very difficult questions uh, and, and for doing it with such courtesy and grace this evening. I, I do thank all of you for that. Uh, I want to thank Gillian. It's always a pleasure to work with Gillian. Climate change.